If you look at any person who has done something exceptional, no exceptions, it's volume of work, right? You look at a bodybuilder who like has a great body, volume of work. You look at Mozart or any artists, you look at Messi, volume of work. There's some level of intellect applied to setting up that system, but at the end of the day, we're doing work. So welcome to the Callum Johnson Show. On today's episode, we have the one, the only Cliff Weitzman. Cliff, so good to be here. welcome to the show. Thank you very much, man. <laughs> this is this is going to be a good one. This is like a, I feel like this is a long time coming. Like, I'm, I'm glad that we got this guy. Okay. I always say to the audience with like, uh, with the intros, I always, I like podcasts. They get straight into it. Yeah. No messing around. No small talk. Just straight to like the good stuff. Perfect. Let's do it. So I'm going to read. Um, I was on the way, obviously, into New York to, this morning. And I was like, I was thinking like, where do I want to start? Mm. And I went through your Twitter. I was like, okay, let me just see what he's like tweeting about. And I found something and I was like, okay. I was like, that, that's the one. So I'm going to read it to you and then I just want to get your reaction. Sure. So this is what you said. You said, you may meet people who know exactly where they want to be in life. Don't let this discourage you. Just because you haven't found your purpose yet doesn't mean you have failed. We're all in different stages of life, and that's the beauty of it. Okay, so here's, what, here's where I want to begin. Um, there's so many people out there, they're trying to find like their purpose, like the thing that they're meant to work on. Yeah. You've obviously found it with Speechify and the company that you've built. What was that moment, what was that stage in your life when you were like, this is what I'm meant to be working on. This episode is brought to you by Free Agency. If you want to take your career to the next level, Free Agency is a company that you should check out. They manage and represent talent in the tech industry, and they provide you with a dedicated talent agent to help you find, engage, and win top of market roles that will maximize your earning potential. No more leaving money on the table. Stop job searching alone and start building your dream career today with Free Agency. Anyway, back to the show. You know, people talk about overnight successes, and we all know that's not actually how it works with anything, not with sports, not with companies, not with music. Um, but I think there's two main important decisions you make in your life, and it's who you're going to marry mm. um, and what you're going to work on, what's going to be your life purpose. And your life purpose uh, almost never is a strike of lightning in one moment. Mm. And so for me, I read maybe like 600 books, like audiobooks by the time I graduated high school. Um, and about everything, you know, business, philosophy, psychology, economics. And I started a couple of small businesses when I was in high school. When I was in college, I studied renewable energy engineering. So it was a mix of physics, engineering, and computer science. But I also took classes in about 15 different departments. Everything from mechanical engineering to industrial design to biotechnology and medicine, photovoltaics. Um, and I traveled a good amount. I figured out how to hack my way uh, to do that, yeah, even though I didn't have you know, any money as a student. Um, and I built about 36 different products as an undergrad, and all with the purpose of figuring out what I wanted to do, what my purpose was going to be. Mm. Going into college, I remember I had to write a letter to my counselor, and I wrote that I wanted to do a double major in renewable energy engineering and economics. I ended up dropping economics and taking some computer science classes instead. And I thought I either wanted to be an entrepreneur or do investment banking. Mm. It took me one meeting with Goldman Sachs to realize there's <laughs> no way I'm doing investment banking. Um, and we can go into that as well. Um, and I find that good writing is good thinking. And so I would always write. Mm. And I would write what I'm grateful for. Um, and I was going to graduate college. And I decided that none of the projects I'd worked on so far was going to be impactful in the world enough to warrant spending the rest of my life doing them. Mm. And so the answer is when I was graduating college, I still did not know what my purpose was. So I tactically figured out how do I engineer an environment where I can figure that out. And so I, and this was tough because all my friends were getting jobs and I was not. Mm. And that feels like a failure state. Mm. Um, but I loved college and I didn't wanna leave. And I convinced two of my professors to sponsor me to stay as a visiting scholar. I found this term in like the constitution of Brown University mm. where I still had an ID. I was on meal plan. I lived on campus. I didn't pay tuition. I didn't do homework, but I got to vagabond classes yeah. and work on projects. And over the summer, I worked as a teacher 
I taught computer science. And that job made me enough money in those three months to support me for the rest of the year. And I was like, I'm going to spend this time working on things. And if I do not come up with something good by the end of the year, I will go teach again and I will go do this again. And I will do this infinite numbers of times until I find the right thing for myself to do. Mm. The question is, what should I work on? And I developed this thesis that the type of thing I wanted to work on was, and this is based kind of on many, many books that I'd read uh, and a lot of writing. Uh, I think that the thing that is strategically advantageous to do is pick a product that you could not have made before, like four years beforehand. Like the world's technology that just did not allow for this to exist. Mm. Because if that is the type of thing that you go after, you cannot have competition. Mm. You know, Google, Amazon, Facebook, they, like, they don't have this product because like it was not possible. Mm. And so around 2015, I started reading a lot of academic papers about the narrow applications of deep learning. And I was very excited by this, especially around speech synthesis, optical character recognition, transcription, translation, natural language processing. And I was like, huh, I could build like a 10x better product here around text-to-speech. But I had been obsessed with text-to-speech since I was 15. And when I was 18, my brother and I built a small app for our computers that let our computers read stuff out to us, right? I'm dyslexic, Tyler's blind in his left eye. We use text-to-speech for everything. And I kept tinkering on this thing, but I don't even count this as one of the 36 products that I built. Um, and then I was frustrated by the fact that I did not know what my purpose was. So what I did is I sat down and I was like, before I graduate, I need to figure this out. And my goal was I started a new Google, uh, Google Doc and I was going to write a 30-page paper about my worldviews and what I believe from everything I'd learned, every experience I had, every book I read. What is the synopsis? Mm. And so I sat and I did this. And it took me several days and I finished it at like four in the morning. Um, and in reading it back, number one, I, I, I cried by the time I finished writing this paper. Um, and I, I, I used the final for one of my classes as, as the, uh, the forcing function to finish this paper. I ended up being able to summarize the 28 principles that I believe that most other people don't believe. And I realized the reason why I am the person that I am is because of my experiences struggling with dyslexia when I was young and from all the audiobooks that I'd read. And I realized that uh, given the changes that occurred around narrow applications of deep learning, I could very easily marry uh, this thing that is very true to me with a technology that did not exist before and was not even mature then yet. And when you think about, think about startups, uh, it's not time in the, it's not timing the water right it, 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 people say you know, it's not timing the market it's the time in the market mm -hmm. i think about the same thing in surfing in surfing if you catch a wave it, it's not like you know you have to stay in the water for a while before the right wave comes but when the right wave comes you already need to swim it, be swimming fast enough to ride mm -hmm. that wave so i was like cool this technology is going to mature in like three to four years i'm going to build the entire infrastructure around it and once it gets really good boom the wave will raise me as well. And so the really big moment was this night where I spent finishing writing this paper. Um, this would have been kind of May of 2016. And then I honed my conviction around this product uh, across many years. So I'll give you the two moments where uh, my conviction was challenged and why I stuck with it. The first one was there were still many other products I wanted to build. Uh, I built this Chrome extension that identified uh, uh, proper nouns in books uh, on the internet in your browser, and it would turn them into links. And if you click on them, you could buy them, and that would get an affiliate fee. Um, and I was really, really into this product. And there were a bunch of other things like that that I built, but I kept getting distracted. And then I read this biography of Michael Bloomberg. Bloomberg, you know, he's a billionaire. He founded Bloomberg LP. But after he became a billionaire, he went and did a lot of philanthropy, right? He was, went and was mayor of New York for three terms. He's consistently one of the top three most charitable people in the world. And I was like, this is pretty consistent. People go and they become billionaires, and then they start philanthropies. So I might as well make sure that whatever I do doesn't only make me a billionaire, but also has that level of impact on the world. Let's say two birds with one stone. So I don't want to do a fintech company. I don't want to be an investment banker. I don't want to work on a random SaaS CRM company. I want to do something that is real. 
And I was like, well, let me consult philosophy. So I really like Malthus, who talks about utilitarianism and you know, how many utils of value you give. So my goal is to make sure that I increase the overall quality of life in the world. And that means that you can kind of measure the utility that each person experiences and how do you just raise the base. Turns out that if someone is really wealthy, it's difficult to increase the utils of value. But if someone has low resources, it's a lot easier to increase the utils of value. Mm. So I was like, cool, maybe I'll go work in you know, slums in India or townships in South Africa. And so I got really into mobile banking and I like messaged you know, 20 banking companies in India and tried to like work on this project. Um, and I was like, but you know what? I really do li like living in the United States mm. and like developed countries, so I don't want to do that. But who are people in the United States who I can help, who have lower utils of value? And I realized that it's actually people like me who have dyslexia, ADHD, low vision, autism, concussions, anxiety, second language learners. No matter how much money you have, if you have dyslexia um, and you struggle with reading, unlike being nearsighted, you can't just put glasses on, right? Mm. Um, unlike ADHD, you can't even take Adderall. You just have to suffer. And I was like, well, if I build this tool, that's a really big deal. So that was the first moment that I built conviction is I realized that I have a deep joy I get from creating value, but especially for people who are like me. Mm. Um, and then I have an asymmetric advantage in building for people like me who suffer from the same challenges. The second time that this was challenged was in 2018 when ICOs were all the rage. And I had a couple of friends who I had helped raise big ICOs. And I thought to myself, gosh, if I go and raise an ICO right now, I can make a lot of money. Mm. And at the time, the retention for Speechify was not as great as I wanted for it to be. And what I ended up doing is I, we had this apartment at the time with like big windows. And on one window, I wrote the reasons pro, why to work on Speechify. And on the other one, I wrote the reasons con, why not to work on Speechify, why to go and do an ICO. And I had a very clear plan for like what ICO I would do. Yeah. And in the end, I decided that I did not think that uh, Bitcoin would be um, useful in production for at least the next 10 years. Um, I, I believe in it, just not that it would create like differentiated value in the short term for end users. Um, but I did believe that the two biggest trends that I was observing from a supply side was the rise of narrow applications and deep learning. And from a consumer behavior shift, the use of audio podcasts, double speed WhatsApp messages, um, audiobooks, et cetera. And so I decided that what made the most sense from a macro perspective was to work on something that is in the intersection of audio and narrow applications of deep learning. And I was, if I was going to do that, I might as well be working on Speechify. So those two moments were when I decided I will not work on anything that is not Speechify. No businesses that are not Speechify. And even my hobbies if I'm going to go deep into them, they may as well just be related to Speechify. So even for music, like most of the songs that I write these days relate to dyslexia, ADHD, anxiety, what have you. And we use them as ads uh, that we run on Instagram or YouTube or whatever. Um, so that's kind of the moment where I figured out what my purpose was, was writing that essay. And then those were the two most important uh, challenging moments against it. Mm, that's fascinating. You know, um, you know what's interesting just listening to you? So. Uh, I'm 25 right now. So I graduated from university four years ago. Okay. In the UK. I studied at Warwick. Um, Warwick is in London? Warwick University. So it's like maybe like an hour outside London. Okay. The capacity of Warwick is maybe 28,000 students. Mm -hmm. I also did a year abroad in Vancouver in Canada oh, wow. at UBC. Okay. I think the capacity there is maybe 30,000 students. So my point is I've I've been across like, a lot of students, right? Like I've, uh, I've been a student, I've spent time with other students, maybe not all like 60,000 or whatever, but hundreds, probably thousands. I have never heard someone speak with that level of intensity, with that level of thirst um, to, I, I've heard people, they, they want to find their purpose, right? I think especially at that age, people are always asking you like, what are you going to do? What do you want to be? All this thing. So I think there's, there's a desire to know the answer. Of course. Which I guess is the first part, is the desire. The second part, which um, it's funny actually, listening to you, this word just came to my mind. I was like, extreme action. Yes. Extreme action. And I think that's 
with, with probably the hundreds, thousands of interactions that I've had with students, with just people in general, I haven't seen that level of extreme action. So the thing that I want to know, because um, on this podcast, it's like, for me, it's all about the audience. Um, the guests obviously have these incredible stories and accomplishments, but I want to give that value to the audience. And I think from the audience's perspective, I'm like, what if they could take even 10%, 20% of that level of action? Mm. When you talk about the number of books that you read, the number of papers that you are reading, the number of apps that you built, um, it's just a ton of time in the field trying yes. things without, before any success, before anything or the lifestyle that, or any of the things and the people that you've come across, and we'll talk about that more in this pod. Before any of that, there was extreme action. So the thing that I wanna know, I wanna know from you is like, how, what even motivated that? Mm. Like how, what made you start taking extreme action? Where does that come from? Yeah, so there's three things in your question. The first one is how do you know which direction to go in? The second one is where do you find the fuel to go this mm. fast? And the third one is like, Dude, why? Mm. Okay. So the world is a complex adapt adaptive system, and so is your life. Um, and that is the beauty of it, is you have to figure out in the chaos how to find order. So in physics, we talk about entropy, right? Everything uh, resolves to randomness. And I think that one of the most beautiful things in the world is what I call reverse entropy. When things are really organized, that's magic. Like, your brain is, in my opinion, the closest thing to a magical object that exists in the world. Like if there were fairies that were attracted to magic, they'd just like float around your brain because mm. it's by far the most complex system in the world. Mm. Like unbelievable how the human body works. And so my uh, objective as a, as a free willing agent in the world whose goal is to make my life amazing and the lives of people around me amazing is to organize the system around me for our benefit. And to, I think, Ideally, create value. Um, so that is the framework that I start from. And then the question is, well, how do you succeed? How do you win? And there's maybe three principles I use. The first one is brute force. Um, you know, I grew up trying to read. I mm. sucked at it. I was so bad, mm. right? First, second, third, fourth grade, I really, really struggled to the point that my teachers thought that I was like, mentally challenged mm. um and you know i have a neurodiverse brain um you can argue that i'm mentally challenged uh my brain just works differently mm. uh, and my parents thought i was lazy i thought i was awesome i just needed to prove it to people mm. and so i had this very clear goal in my mind learn how to read and while everybody else was succeeding in doing it like i was not succeeding mm. uh to give you a good analogy imagine that you're in a race with everybody else in your school and you know, there's like three guys in the front of the race and then like they're fighting to see who's going to be first. And you're not, not only you're not in the front, you're not in the middle, you're in the back. You're not racing to win. You're not even racing, racing to not lose. You're racing to not have the entire class lap you. Mm. And it's not going your way. And yet you think you're awesome. So the first thing that I have is this just ingrained belief that anything I set my mind to, I can do, no matter what, given enough time. It might not happen today. It might not happen tomorrow. It might not happen in five years, but I will make it happen. It will not happen over because of randomness. It will happen because I will make it happen. Okay. <laughs> Where does that come from? Mm. That's very easy. It comes from having two parents who gave me unconditional love my entire childhood, having four siblings who did the same, and if you want to create an excellent life for people around you, mm. just give them unconditional love. And uh, love is the most important thing in life. And the more you give of it, the more you have to give. It's like fire. You can light an additional candle without extinguishing the original flame. I think about it like a jug. The more you pour out of it, the bigger the jug gets. When you give love, the well of capacity you have for love increases. Mm. and like breaks the laws of thermodynamics. Um, so that's the biggest thing that you could do is just give a lot of love to everybody around you and surprise, I'll give it back to you unconditionally. Mm. So that's where the belief comes from. Then there's the, the vision. Um, 
which is, look, I just identify what is the thing that is the most important. And then I organize the system in order to get to that thing. So like a really good example is I was paying for college. Um, Brown is expensive. My junior year, I decided, look, I need to find a way to reduce the amount of debt I have because given this amount of debt, I will not be able to do my own thing when I graduate. I have to take a job and I don't want to. And so I started applying to scholarships. And I realized that there's actually a lot of scholarships on the internet. It's just like finding the right ones for you to apply for that you are relevant to, right? Mm. I wanted scholarships for people studying math who are Jewish in Marin County um, with like a you know, 3.9 GPA, whatever it might be. So I ended up hiring 10 freelancers in the Philippines to find and apply to scholarships for me full time. And I uh, automated the Upwork API to hire really good um, uh, virtual assistants for me. And I wrote a series of Google Sheets that instructed how to scrape and look for scholarships on the internet. And each person had to help me find 100 scholarships that had to be above $1,000 and fiddle the following criteria. And then I uploaded all my essays and had them help me apply. Mm. Uh, and I won a lot of scholarship money this way. And so this is a efficient system that mm. uses large amounts of numbers at the top of the funnel and brute force. You know, there's some level of intellect applied to setting up that system, but at the end of the day, we're doing work. And the thing is, uh, uh, if you look at any person who has done something exceptional without no exceptions, it's volume of work, right? You look at a bodybuilder who like has a great body, volume of work. Mm. You look at Mozart or any artists, volume of work, right? You look at Messi, volume of work. Like every single person who is exceptional, they have put, there's so much work between them and second best person, typically. Um, and if you read books about this, about genius, right? Uh, smart is hitting a target other people can't hit. Genius is hitting a target other people can't see. Um, and the only way that you get to that level is you start to have contextual awareness of your field that is only achieved by time in the field, right? Mm -hmm. So Theodore Roosevelt has a really great poem about this, right? Um, uh, not to the critic goes the credit, but to the man in the arena, in the arena whose face is martyrdom, blood and tears and soot. Um, and so that is the key, is you have to engage the world. And so you said, uh, uh, I can't remember the phrase that you used, maybe extreme action. Extreme action. Extreme action. So I think about it as bias towards action. I have an extreme bias towards action. Like I, if I see a cliff and there's a lake, like I don't, I just jump off the cliff into the lake because that is fun. Mm. Uh, I don't give myself the time to like not do it. Like do it first, think second, typically with the exception of if you might hurt someone else in the process, then definitely think twice. Um, the first rule is just do no harm. Um, and, and then you learn from that action. And so what I found is if you read enough books, you get to the point that books start repeating themselves and there's value in that. But the next frontier is finding people who are practitioners in the field who are on the bleeding edge and that's where you learn the most. Like my favorite classes at Brown were classes like master's classes in photovoltaics engineering where I literally could not Google or Wikipedia the topics because the mm -hmm. professor had researched it. And if I needed help on my homework, uh, if I didn't want to ask the professor, I would message professors at Harvard, Stanford, and MIT to have them help me with my homework mm. because there was just like no one else who could teach me this stuff. I loved that. Like that was so exciting to me. So find the vision, believe that you can do it, do a crazy volume of work, and then the last thing that I do that's probably my zone of genius that is unique to me is I'm very, very good at designing systems that when run over and over again, achieve a specific objective. So computer science is all about algorithms, right? You call a method, the method runs, and if it didn't get the outcome that it wanted by the end, it runs again, it calls itself, right? It's called recursion. And then it runs again and again and again and again and again. Uh, you can also do this inside of a for loop. I build algorithms for real life. It doesn't matter whether it's learning how to be really good at gymnastics and parkour, uh, how to build a company, how to find your purpose, um, how to write really good music. I write all my songs in Google Sheets, um, how to find scholarships. I just mm. find the system and I believe in the system and I constantly tweak and improve the system. And at the end of the day, I get to the goal. So self-belief, clear vision, and then just do it over and over and over again and mm. readjust the process as it goes. And that's how you use extreme action to literally get any outcome you want in life. Mm. And then you finally, to answer your original question, dude, why? Why are you working so hard? What's the point of all this? Like, don't you want to chill? No, <laughs> absolutely not. I remember when I moved to the United States 
and, and I still has an, had an Israeli accent, you know, I, I didn't know people very well. My parents was like, you know, Cliff, why don't you go, you know, make friends with people? Um, so I did that. I, I went and I hung out with kids at my middle school. And all they would do is sit on this bench in the park and talk mm. and hang out. <laughs> oh my God, I hated hanging out. It was so boring. Yeah. So I did this for maybe like two or three weeks. And by the end of the third week, I was like, I'm done with this. No more hanging out for me. Yeah. Um, and I went home and I like built apps with my little brother, Tyler. Um, or, you know, I'd write music with my sister, Alex. Or, you know, Geffen and I would like shoot a like home movie. Or Eric's and I would go biking. Like I wanted action. Uh, and listen to audiobooks. And so I uh, get joy from doing stuff. And I think most people are like this as well. Like if you look, for example, if you ask kids, what job do you want? The majority of kids now answer that they want to be a YouTuber. Mm. And the reason they want to be a YouTuber is because there's all these vloggers who fill the vlogs with action. Mm. Like life is fun. I live life like I'm the, like the main character of my story. Mm. And every person should live their life that way. And so the main character, if you read really good books, the common thread is this concept of characters that are always taking action. They wake up, they work out, they go do this, they go do that. Like their are just like sitting around on the couch. Mm. Um, so that's one. Two, when I was a kid, I wanted to be prime minister of Israel, a billionaire and a pop star all at the same time. And I was like, yeah, of course I can do this. And I just like always believed that I could do stuff. Over time, that goal range changed mm. uh, because I like, you know, got to know life better. And now my talk goals are... Uh, number one, I want to be the best dad that I can be. Mm. Um, so I'm not married. I don't have kids. So uh, how do I get to that? What's the precursor to that? Well, it's be the best person that I can be and then have kids who are greater than me. Number two is give as much love as possible to my family, friends, significant others, the world. Um, and how do you give love to the world? You create value. So number mm. three is create as much value in the world and elevate the collective quality of life. In the short term, that happens by building software like Speedify. And in the long term, it's by doing more mentoring. Um, and so that's how that has evolved. And then there is such a big distance between me as the world sees me today mm. and me as a, how I see myself in my brain. And it pains me, this distance, and I need to close it as soon as possible. Mm. And so I just work every single day to close that distance. Um, and I think that's a lot of where the motivation comes from. Mm. See, that's interesting. You know, um... It's actually, it's, it's interesting listening to you because you spoke about the belief. And even when you started, you were talking about like the unconditional love of your parents and that dynamic. And I think a big thing that I've realized, right? I remember my dad always used to, to say to me, like, focus on the foundation. Mm. Everything starts with the foundation. And I think it's the same in our lives as people. So a lot of who we are a lot of um, our default, where we just tend to go, it's, it's really formed in those initial years, in those beginning years, and especially in those interactions with our parents. Yeah. And so when I listen to you, it's like the, the way you think is unique, mm. right? Mm. And I know even for me, for me personally, I think one of, um, one of the, sh I think the strength I'm the most grateful for is like just my self-belief. Yeah. Like, I just think I'm going to get it done. And I've been like that since I was a kid. Like, I would, um, I have an older brother. We would compete over everything. Like, everything was a competition. And I would lose every time because he's mm. eight years older. But I, I, every time, the next time we competed, I was like, I'm going to win. Every time. And it's the same. It's the same now. And so I guess, you know, actually, let, let's, let's go to this. I'm curious if you've ever thought about this. Um, I think it's such a huge advantage to have parents that instill that into you. Of course. That give you that. For the person, though, that doesn't have that, is there another method, another way that I can start to get that belief where I'm like, anything that I put my mind to and I apply that brute force that you spoke about, it will imprint on the world. It will happen. Yes. Is there another way? Yes, there's two. So... Uh, even more important than that belief is what I talked about before, which is at the end of the day, what does everybody want more than anything else? It's to be loved, right? Everybody wants to be loved. So if for a sad reason, your parents are not good at expressing that, um, you can get that for friends, especially today, right? They could be in your school. 
They could be in your city. They could be in other cities all around the world, right? One of my top goals is to just make friends with all the most awesome people in the world. Mm. How do you get unconditional love from other people? You give them unconditional love. And so the most important element of luck in your life is who you're born to. And you can't control that. But you can't control who your friends are. So pick your friends. Pick them well. And once you pick them, you are their ride or die. Mm. Like this person doesn't have a place to stay. They sleep in your bed, right? This person, you know, wants to work out. You show up at their house. You force them to come to the gym. You throw away all the junk food from their cupboards. You help them buy groceries. Like their biggest dream is to be a YouTuber, but like they're not getting off their ass. You sit there and edit the first YouTube video with them. Mm -hmm. Like they have like a really big challenge. They're across the world. You get on a plane. Like if you treat people like that and you do that three, four times, they will do that for you for the rest of your life. So uh, that will build the bedrock, the uh, backstop beyond which you can never fall. Mm -hmm. And then you can't really ever fail. Um, mm -hmm. One thing about evolution, and then I'll give the other more tactical answer. Um, you know, people think that it's survival of the fittest. Um, I think that there's a caveat to that. Um, there's a bunch of studies that were done at Stanford when you have free agents who fight each other. It's called tit for tat. And they found that the agent that uh, performed the best, the algorithm that did the best, is if you hit me, I'll hit you back in the same equal level. And mm -hmm. then nobody hits you in the end. Uh, like, oh, okay, well, you know, uh, survival of the fittest, just, you know, be as strong as possible. So you can do that even if someone's stronger than you. Real survival in nature falls into families at the end of the day. Why are families so important? Because families save you from existential crises. So no matter how strong you are, you will face a situation in nature that you cannot handle. Mm. You develop an addiction. You get injured. You get sick. Um, you get scammed. You have a loan that you default. Whatever it might be. That's the point where your family comes in. And so society is, in general works best by capitalism. But small groups like families work best um, with like socialist communist behavior mm. where, uh, you know, I just give without expectation of receiving. And in a small group that works because the personal bond keeps you there. And so this is why moms are so important is if you really fuck up, your mom will always be there for you mm -hmm. and vice versa, you'll be there for her. Um, okay, so that's the first one is give love to other people, they'll give it back to you. The second one to build the self-belief and drive if you didn't get it you know, from your parents is you can build it for yourself very easily and here's why, here's how. When I was a kid, I loved music, I loved singing. And I found this, um, my mom found this uh, singing, dancing choir uh, called Pnine HaSharon in Israel. There was like 100 kids. And it was like a very, very like selective group. And I got in, but I got in late. Like some of these, ki these kids were there for like three years already. And I really wanted to get a solo. And they were going to have auditions for a solo. And I was like, I'm going to get the solo. And I was like, ah, like there's these two particular people in the band who are like really, really good and they get all the solos and they'll probably get the solo. Mm. But you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take the next 48 hours and all I'm gonna do is practice the solo. Like I'm gonna learn how to play it on piano. I'm gonna sing it over and over. I'm gonna sing it 500 times before I get to the solo. And there's no way they're going to spend the 48, 24 hours before this audition practicing to the degree that I'm gonna practice. Just mm. no way. And by the way, there's many moments in my life where I just use this strategy. To just win whatever outwork. I wanted. To. Outwork. Yeah, outwork. but for like a time box period of time, like 24 hours. I'm just, mm. uh, my life, pitch competition, my life for the next 24 hours is working on this pitch for this pitch competition. I'm going to go to the dining hall. I'll talk to every single person and say, hey, do you got a minute? Great. I have a pitch I need to get tomorrow. Can I give it to you? Awesome. Boom. Can you pitch it back to me? Awesome. How can I improve it? And you just like spend 24 hours. You barely sleep. All you do is work on that thing. No one's going to do that. So I did that. I still didn't get the solo. They got the solo. But Afterwards, the guy who ran the band took me to the side. I was like, Cliff, that was really impressive. Your growth rate from last time was like insane. And you were so comfortable up there. Why was I comfortable? Because I'd sang the song like 600 times already. Mm -hmm. so he's like, look, they, I'm going to give this solo to you know, this guy. But um, there's another thing that I think you'd be great at here. I'm gonna, I want you to do the solo in this song. This song is more about energy as opposed to vocal range. So I got that song. And then it started to be that automatically I started getting a lot of soul. Anything that had like soul in it and energy, mm -hmm. I received. And like that required you to be comfortable or confident. Um, and then there was like a series of like 
skits that they did for like commercials and TV and like they pulled me into that. Um, if you just brute force your way through everything um, and uh, by the way, this was not the first audition. There may be like three, four, five auditions beforehand, but I applied the same types of principles and I didn't get it. Life will converge to help you. Uh, but also a great quote by Abraham Lincoln, you cannot fail unless you quit. Hmm. I was interested in doing music for a very long time, you know, since I was like five. And I auditioned for plays, I auditioned for shows, I auditioned for solos. It happened to be that, you know, it came to fruition when I was like 11 and a half. But like, there are a couple of years beforehand. And like, I just never got discouraged. I was like, always volunteered, always showed up, always wanted to, you know, play. And so don't count it as a failure until you're dead. Hmm. That's it. I still have goals in my goal sheet. I track all my goals in Google Sheet that I had when I was like 14. You know, I wanted to learn how to do a backflip, how to do a front flip, how to do a cork, how to do a rise to cork. All right. So recently I learned how to do a cork, which is like a move and tricking. I'm trying to learn how to do a rise to cork, which is like a lot more difficult. But like most people who do tricking, like when they go on to college and they go, to, they like, they stop the sport. I never stopped the sport because I always track my goals. And I said, I would get a rise to cork. So it doesn't matter if I'm 65. I'm going to train my joints and I'm going to get a rise to cork mm -hmm. because I promised myself that I would do it. So that's the other goal is if you make a promise to yourself, never break that promise because breaking that promise is giving yourself permission to not be congruent with your agreements with yourself. You want to be immaculate with your agreements with yourself. And that's where self-confidence comes from. It's when you promise yourself something mm -hmm. and you hold the promise, that's where self-confidence comes from. Because the person who you care the most about their opinion of you is yourself. Mm. So interesting. You know, it's, um, it's funny because I'm watching, do you watch UFC? You into like UFC? I don't watch UFC, but I have friends who are really into it. Okay, cool. Um, I was never really that into UFC until a few years ago. And the person that got me into it was Conor McGregor. Okay. And I remember, this was when he was already like, kind of big i was like i would just start watching these documentaries mm. and like videos about his time coming up and it was just crazy like the self-belief yeah and so his, his documentary just came out on netflix and it's a docu-series so i watched the first i've watched the first two episodes and i've kind of watched everything that this guy said at this point um but watching the docu-series the thing that came out i was like this guy brainwashed himself to success. Exactly. Like everything he did, he, he brainwashed himself. There's this, and not to spoil it for people, though I guess I am kind of. Um, there's this moment where he's like, he's on a boat. Um, he's on vacation with his family. They're on a boat and they're like, they're going through the water and there's like alligators. And so an alligator comes up to the boat and he's literally looking dead in the eyes of the alligator. And he's like, he's afraid. He doesn't want this. He's, and I'm like, this guy is crazy. Like he brainwashes himself that he is like the ultimate warrior, right? Mm. No one can defeat him. Um, and I think that's the thing, right? That, that's why the belief is so critical. And it's exactly what you said. It's like, um, like when is it over? Like it's, you, exactly. you, haven't, you haven't failed yet. Correct. You're, you're still going. There's still more reps. Yeah. The game's not And over. you may have lost the battle, but you didn't lose the war. Now, the example you gave with McGregor is interesting because that is a closed system game mm. because you're fighting other people. And so, you know, either McGregor loses or the alligator loses. Like, there's no mm. world where... But let's say your goal is to make a million dollars. Mm. You can't lose making a million dollars. The worst thing that you'd be is you can get reset to zero. Maybe you get in debt $5 million and you file for bankruptcy. But you, until you're dead, the game isn't over. Mm. Like you cannot definitively lose at making a million dollars because every single day you could make a million dollars. Mm. Um, and so that's the thing is you want to play um, not closed systems, but open systems. And uh, actually, if you the difference between capitalism and communism is you read the Communist Manifesto, there's a... I think in the second chapter, there's a line. Um, whenever there's a trade occurring between uh, one man and another, one man tells the other, I fleece you. As in, in every deal, someone loses and someone wins. Hmm. Which is, this is a fundamentally broken understanding because actually when deals occur, you create value. 
right? Because uh, if I live in the village and there's a lot of peaches in the village and I come to the city and you have a bicycle that's available in the city but not in the, vi- in the village and I trade you 500 peaches for your bicycle, like we both won. Mm-hmm. You already had a bicycle. There's diminishing marginal return to another bicycle. There's diminishing marginal return to like the 500th peach. Uh, so we both won. Um, and so uh, in economics, you talk about the PPF curve, uh, shifting the potential possibility frontier to the right. That is what creating value is uh, denoted as in economics. Um, and so you are in an open-ended system. In every single moment, you can create new value that didn't exist before. So for you to win, nobody else needs to lose. Mm. So that's the key. Is in McGregor's exa- example, someone needs to lose for McGregor to win. But like when you're going through life and your goal is to like build a happy family, build a house, do any of these things, nobody needs to lose. Mm. Which means that you have an infinite runway to achieve the goal that you set. Mm. You know what? It makes sense because um, I remember listening um, to some of the content and some of the videos that you did with Ali Abdal. Mm. And obviously, um, he's had some amazing people on his podcast. And I'm sure just like in his life, even outside of content, he's met, he's met some incredible people. I remember him saying um, the thing that stood out, stood out about you was like how you develop relationships, mm. your ability to build relationships. Um, when I heard you say what you just said, it's like, it makes sense, right? Because relation, the best relationships are win-win. Of course. So it's like, if you're, if you're creating value together, if it's win-win, even what you were saying about, um, you just go hard for your friends. Yeah. It's like, that's reciprocated. It's like value. So you do this thing. And even though this isn't your intention, this isn't why you're making friends in the long term. All of that love, all of that support, all of that friendship is paid back to you 10 times. Oh, yeah. And I want to go back to something. I want to go back to something that you said when you were talking about um, friends. And here, here is what I think is really the, the critical thing for people. Because you, you, you said a lot of great things. You said about, you know, going hard for your friends, doing anything for them. I want to take it one step before that Mm. which is selecting Mm. the friends and here's why i think that's important is especially when we go back to the conversation around like parents how we grew up um the foundation i all think to to differing degrees we're like dealing with trauma right there's things that have happened in our past which continue to affect us today and going into the future and so And this is the case with friendship. This is the case I've learned personally, also with relationships. A lot of the time, um, it's like when you go into school and you're at the lunch table and there's like, there's the table that you want to sit at. Every person has had this. Yeah. You're like, I want to, I want those people to like me. And the reason you want those people to like you most likely is also linked to something in that past. You're, You're searching for something. And so my point is, is that, Often we're looking for the wrong friends. Mm, mm-hmm. How can someone look for the right friends? Who are the right friends? Yeah. So one saying I have is no friends is better than bad friends. Mm. Um, and bad friends isn't even like people who are like in the corner doing drugs. Bad friends are just like friends who don't elevate you and don't make you a better person. Right. You are the average of your five best friends. So if you have five best friends who are like weighing you down, you're, you're going to be less good of a person. Mm. Okay. First and foremost, um, my biggest privilege in life is the family that I was born to. Not because we had money, we didn't, but because of the amount of love, respect, generosity that occurs inside of the family. So that's my privilege. So whoever is listening to this, steal my privilege. I'm going to give you the most valuable thing that I learned from being in my family. If you have a dad like mine, who no matter what is there for you, right? When you're a kid, and your teachers think you're stupid, and your parents think you're lazy, and your dad is mad at you for like not trying to read, and still this man comes back from like his long day at work, and his number one priority is to read books to you, and mm. he gets you to fall in love with books because if you're not going to read, he's just going to read them to you. Sounds familiar to the behavior pattern that I explained. Um, and gives you hugs and cuddles and like smiles at you and believes in you and always always there for you. You're going to be that way to other people. You're going to be generous with your kindness, with your time, with your love. And pretty quickly, when you have a person who is in your life and you leave, you're going to say, I love you or love you, brother, or whatever it might be. And so there's a great line from Tim Ferriss 
Uh, your success in life can be measured by the number of difficult conversations you have. There's a better saying by Cliff Weitzman. Your success in life can be measured by the number of conversations you finish with I love you. Mm. So be that person. So I'm the way that I am. Very easy because of my dad. Very privileged to have my dad. Mm. If you don't have a dad like mine, make a decision right now that you're going to act like you did and just treat everybody else the way that my dad treats me. Your life will be amazing from this point forward. Mm. And here's the thing. There's not a lot of risk in doing this. Telling someone I love you on the third, fourth interaction who's another man or a woman that you're friendly with in a completely platonic way, there's no risk. Maybe they'll think that you're weird. If they think that you're weird, they're probably not the type of person you want to be friends with anyway. Mm. So now here's what you did. You made it explicit that you care about them more than they care about you. Mm. Some people are shy of that because in a social hierarchy, you know, maybe there's leverage, but I don't care. I, care, I do care more about you than you care about me because I just care a lot and I want you to know that I care. And then you attract, invite two different types of people into your life. Mm. You invite the people who are like, ah, he cares, let me mooch. You invite the people who are like, ah, he cares, let me show him I care more. Mm. It's not particularly difficult to figure out who are the moochers and who are the people who care more. Yeah, you'll just see it in their actions. So be nice to everybody, but be discerning, judge. Don't be um, oblivious. Okay. So that's the first way of doing it. Is just give a lot of love. Mm. Um, and then you said, how, how do you pick your friends? Um, you know, in that situation in middle school where I decided I didn't want to hang out on the park bench, that was me making an explicit decision that I did not want to pick those friends. Um, who did I want to pick? I want to pick my siblings as my friends because I really admire them. Mm. I, I admire Tyler, Alex, Geff, and Eric's. Like, they are the people who I wanted to spend time with. I did all this work to get into Brown because I wanted to be around the people there. Mm. Most people, when they apply to college, apply to six schools. I applied to 26 schools. I brute forced the common app. Sounds familiar? Uh, because I figured out that any one of these top schools can take 10 classes of incoming kids. At this point, it's 20 of people with 4.0 GPAs who were captain of the soccer team and like all this good stuff. So it's a lottery. So how do you win a lottery? You brute force it. You just buy as many tickets as possible. So that's what I did. Um, and I ended up at Brown and I learned that it was ranked for eight years in a row, the happiest school in the world. And so once again, volume for the first three months, I would have three dinners every night. I would go to a table, of seven people I didn't know. I'd be like, Hey, what's your name? Ben, I'm Cliff. Nice to meet you. Can I sit here? Awesome. Boom. Sit, have a conversation. Grab another plate. Talk to another table. Grab a cup of tea. Talk to another table. And I just did this every single day for three months. I got to know more than 60% of my grade. The next year I did the same thing with a freshman. The next year I did the same thing. So I got to know all the school very quickly. And the people who I resonated with, I exchanged phone numbers. I'd invite them to go to the gym. And again, I'm not wasting my time. I'm going to eat dinner anyway. And mm. at this time, I was eating like 3,500 calories a day because I was trying to bulk. So I needed to eat anyway. Mm. And I needed to work out anyway. And I like, like playing music anyway. I'd invite people to do things that I was going to do anyway, whether they were there or not. So I made great friends. Like within that closed system of Brown University, I was friends with the people who I admire the most. And like, uh, and I even know who I missed. I know who are the people who are like awesome. And I did try to be their friend. And, you know, life happens, whatever. But like, we're acquaintances. We're just not as tight of our friends as we could be. Mm. So over the summers, by the way, I would literally take a piece of paper and I would write, here are the people of Brown who I should be friends with, who I'm currently not friends with. And I'll even tell you the names of the people who are on my list and what I did. So one was this guy, Dan Schiebler, who was a beast. Yeah. He was the uh, captain of like the MMA club. Mm. And he was a uh, pre-med student, but he got into computer science. And you see this gigantic dude in scrubs on this tiny computer doing like the hardest computer science classes. This guy's amazing. Or like Max Easton, who's this guy from the UK who started like an alcoholic ginger beer company with this other guy, Nico. So like these are three people. Uh, this guy, Alfie, who ended up, I think he worked at Pixar in the end. Uh, this guy, Ati. Uh, from India who I really admired. And like, maybe like there were 10 more people on the list. So I was like, cool. These people I want to be friends with, I, I know them, they know me, but like I'm not friends friends with them. So let me like try to be friends friends with them. So I messaged all of them at the time, like Facebook Messenger was what everybody was using. And I was like, hey, this is like a month before school starts. Hey, I want to be close friends with you. I think you're awesome. Do you want to grab lunch Tuesday, September 14 at 1 p.m. in the rally? Every single one of them said yes. So I just send them a calendar invite to their email. It's now on the calendar. It's locked in. 
And at those times, we went and we grabbed lunch. Mm. And then, you know, we kept talking. If we didn't have each other's numbers, we exchanged numbers. Uh, actually, I can tell you why I didn't become friends with these people. Uh, for a different multitude of reasons, these people could not come work out with me. Mm. Almost all my friendships started with either grabbing lunch, grabbing dinner, or grabbing coffee, and then going to work out together. Dan Schiebler was like way ahead of me in his ability to work out, so inappropriate. <laughs> and the other four people on this list, uh, like lifting was not like the biggest thing in, in their lives at the time. Uh, but like Valentin Perez and Max Deutsch, who were like the two most amazing people I went to Brown with, like they fit all the other criteria and they were into lifting. Same thing for like, you know, Chai Tu, who now works at Speechify with me, um, on Speechify with me. Uh, they were down to work out, so great. By the way, the reason these other four guys that were not into working out, they also all happened to be like very attractive people. So like working out, I think was just like not as, impre- as important to them. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, interesting. I never thought about this. And so I should have done a better job finding alternative activities. So the mm. alternative activities for me uh, are playing music. Um, uh, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't spend time like at parties much. Uh, I will go to parties to like dance. So I went to parties like every single Friday, Saturday night at Brown the entire time because like I wanted to have fun and meet people. Um, but again, like there's like a, a limit to how many hours there are in the day and how many people you can interact with. But like it's funny that, you know, I have a lot of very close friends that came to Brown. I know who the people are who would have been even better friends. I just didn't have the time and like it didn't work out in like that space. And by the way, we still message each other, me and the people who I mentioned. Uh, because we have mutual respect. It's just like we never got to spend significant amount of time together. And so the same thing is true now. Like I'm constantly finding people who I think are awesome. And then if I can, I go and spend time with them and vice versa. And I give them love, even if, you know, I haven't, you know, gotten to spend time with them. Like whatever I could do to make their lives better, like I, I seek to do it. Um, so I gave some attributes, but you want people who will help you grow in an area of life that you otherwise would not grow. Like that's a great mm. attribute for how to pick a friend. So fitness can be one of them. Music can be another. Um, how their interpersonal skills are with others is another. Obviously, if they're really great at business, um, if they're really good-hearted, kind-hearted people, that's like a must. You know, I will not uh, invest my time in someone unless they are a good person. Mm. All these attributes are key. And then the key to then building friendships that are deeper is, um, is just, you know, inviting someone to a recurring activity that you can do together. Mm. And if you do that, your life will be great. Mm. Mm. No, very good. Um, I think, um, I think one thing, uh, even growing up, like, Mm -hmm. um, similar to you, and we spoke about like the belief thing, right? Um, I always wanted to be successful, right? Like I always dreamed of success. And the way that I kind of went about doing it, I was like, okay, I'm just going to study it. Mm. And so I just started to, and I was always into like sports and business. So any entrepreneur, any athlete that I admired, I would go on YouTube, uh, go to podcasts, go to books, and I would just study everything they did. And I used to love to do it with... um, a lot of like athletes, a lot of people in sports. And I would, it would go so deep that I would even go to like their post game footage, you know, when they give their interviews and I would just listen to everything they said. How do they respond to when they blow out a team and it's a big victory? How do they respond to defeat? How do they respond to a draw? If we're talking about football, I would study it. And it's interesting. You actually said this as well earlier on. I caught it. Um, You do a similar thing in the sense, which is like, probably for you, it's like the reading books, you start to see patterns. And it's interesting, right? Like you'll probably read like an autobiography of someone who's alive today. You'll see patterns from like a philosophy book that was written hundreds of years ago. The reason I say that is that um, a lot of things in life have actually kind of been figured out. Yes. Like things are simple, like it's already there. It's simple, but it's difficult to execute. And so I think to this episode, if someone was listening to this, you've used the word or the phrase brute force, just brute force it. That's kind of, that, that's to, to a certain degree, that's the lesson. Yes. If you were going to make it really simple, it's like, just get a lot of volume in. Yes. Like just get the volume in. And so here's where my mind goes after I kind of come to that conclusion. Why aren't 
Mm. What, what stops us from getting the volume? Because people don't get volume like the way that you're getting volume, okay? <laughs> they're, not, they're not brute forcing it to that degree. And so when I think about why aren't people getting the volume, and I think even in, in not even just people, even in my own life, there's, there's aspects where I'm not getting the volume. I'm not getting the number of reps that is needed for me to achieve the result that I want. So, so why? why? Why is that, right? And I think the reason why, probably for 99% of cases, is one word. That one word is fear. Okay. I'm afraid. Of what? Not even just me personally. I think people in general. You're scared. Of what? So even when, um, let me explain it. So even when you talk about the thing with the lunchroom, right? Yeah. And you're, oh, you're, meeting, with, you're meeting with different people. What is stopping someone who's the college student um, from going up to someone new that day and sitting next to them and being like, oh, like we should grab lunch or we should go to the gym? It's what, what, what's the thought loop? It's like, oh, they're going to think I'm like a dork or like, a, like, why am I coming up to them? I'm not in this group. Uh, everyone's going to be looking at me. All of the thoughts yeah. start with fear. Totally. What stops someone from building a business? What stops someone from even when you were like messaging professors to learn about papers? What stops someone from doing that? Oh, if I email them, they, they won't respond. And what does that say about me? The thought is always starting with fear. I even think about it in a relationship sense, right? One of the things that's interesting to me at the moment is like the whole online dating thing, the whole people are unable to connect in this mm. generation and build these authentic relationships and find the person that is right for them on both sides with men and women. Um, what is the problem there? Like a lot of the times you'll see a, a girl that you're like, oh, she looks amazing. You're scared to go up. Yeah. It all begins with fear. You seem to have mastered the fear side of it. Totally. So give us the breakdown. How can someone yeah. overcome fear? Okay, so there's two uh, types of fear here that you're discussing. The first one is fear of doing a massive action around you know, launching something in your life, a brand, a company, whatever. And the second one is social interactions. So first, let me address uh, doing something hard. Uh, there's an equation, which is if my dream is X, X has X value. But there's a multiplier against X, which is the probability that I will actually get it if I put in the work. Mm -hmm. And there's the amount of pain that is associated with doing one you know, rep of the work and then how many reps of the work needs to happen. All right. Let's say I told you that I have a Ferrari over here. It's bright red. It's a convertible. If you pick up a thousand water bottles, empty water bottles, I will give you the Ferrari. If you were not sure that I was serious, there's no way you'd go pick up a thousand water bottles. But if I told you, I am 100% serious, here is the Ferrari. Here is the deed to the Ferrari, right? I have written your name with the exception of the last letter, and I'm publicly announcing it to all of my audience that I will give you the Ferrari if you're going to pick up a thousand water bottles. You go pick up a thousand water bottles immediately hmm. because you're sure that you're going to get the Ferrari if you actually do it. Now, yes, it's annoying to bend down and pick up a water bottle. You can find it, but like you take the trash bag. It'll take you like three days, but then you have a Ferrari. It's totally worth it. Hmm. But if you're not sure you're going to get it, you're not going to do it. All right. So here's the thing. I have a very clear vision for my life for what I'm going to have. Let's take as an example, uh, you know, uh, being fit. Hmm. There's work associated with being fit. You got to eat right. You got to lift. You got to wake up. You got to go to sleep. You got to do all this stuff. But the value of having the body of your dream is X. I know that the body is a science equation, right? And energy cannot be created or destroyed. So if I eat the correct macronutrients and I lift the correct volume, I will 100% get to the body that I want. The only exception is if I track my macros wrong or if I have some issue with my hormones, but I'll track that too. So I'm really motivated to work out. And I'm really motivated to eat well because I know 100% I will get the outcome that I want. Let's say you want to build a business. I know 100% that I'm going to get the outcome that I want because I've read thousands of books about entrepreneurs who have succeeded. And I know I'm willing to work as hard as them, if not harder. I know that I'm not less smart. Um, I know that the world has way more opportunity today than it had 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago for someone young, like crazy more opportunity. So my belief in the game is high and my belief in myself is high. 
And so, the, and so this is economics is called expected value. And so the first thing to do is just fix your mind that that multiplier of whether you'll actually get the thing if you do the work, just make it 100. Mm. Don't make it 60. Don't make it 30. Don't make it 80. Make it 100. Like, really believe. And if you don't really believe, read more, learn more, study more, mm. build your conviction. And so we talked about the fact that I had to build conviction to work on Speechify and not anything else. It's because I build conviction that if I do the work, this will be worth billions of dollars a year in revenue. Mm. But I built the conviction because I use text to speech every single day to listen to like 300,000 words a week plus across the last 15 years. Like I'm the person that I am today because I listen to everything at 700 to 800 words per minute and I go through all the books that I go through. And I've seen, you know, so many people, 25 million people using Speechify. So that's the first thing. It's just like brainwash yourself, not only for your self-confidence, but also that multiplier that you're actually going to get the thing. All right, now let's talk about the social side. If I go to the popular table at lunch and, you know, I ask to sit there and I look like a dork, um, that's embarrassing. That's not nice. That's like, you know, it feels bad. Um, it's true that I do not feel fear of rejection. I might. I know how to coach myself out of it. Um, the main thing that stops me is I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of ways that you can mitigate that. Let's say you want to talk to a girl and, you know, she's studying in the library and she's got her headphones in. Like, how do you do it without making her feel uncomfortable? Well, maybe like write a little piece of note, paper, slide it over, say, hey, I think you look really cute. Would love to grab coffee sometime. Here's my, you know, Instagram website, name, whatever, phone number. You're not disturbing the girl in that situation. All right. So really what people are afraid of is they are presenting themselves to be evaluated by the other person mm. and they are terrified of being evaluated as less than. Mm, 100%. All right. How do you mitigate that risk? How do you solve that problem? It's actually really easy. You build a couple of things in your life that are phenomenal. Like you got to build some pillars of excellence that are evident both to you and to other people. So when I was in middle school, it was difficult for me to have friends, to make friends because I had an accent. I was really, really small and skinny. Um, you know, people didn't know that I was particularly intelligent because like, how could I express it? So no wonder it was like, you know, difficult for me to build friends. Who are the people who typically are the most popular? The prettiest girl, the tallest guy, who is the best at soccer. There are attributes that make them attractive to other kids around them, pillars of excellence mm -hmm. in relation to the rest of the group. So just pick some pillars of excellence and build them out. Do you want to hang out with McGregor now? Of course, because he's one of the biggest UFC fighters in the world. Did you want to hang out with McGregor like 25 years ago when he was like poor and not doing No, because there's nothing excellent about him and we're all attracted to excellence. So pick three areas and just become awesome at them. All right, what are the awesome things about me? Well, I probably read more books than you and I can teach you about the books. I'm really good at working out and I, like you can see from my shoulders that you know I lift and I can do a backflip. Like that, the backflip is like the easiest, 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 easiest way of establishing social value instantly. Mm -hmm. If I'm in a room and I feel uncomfortable, like people like don't wanna spend time with me, I'll start a conversation with a random person and I'll drop a hint that I could do backflips anywhere. And they'll be like, oh my God, do a backflip. I do a backflip. Instantly, I'm the most highest value social person in the room. Mm -hmm. Instantly. It happened instantly. Why? Because nobody else can do a backflip. And it's really cool. And I entertained everybody. Now everybody will want to come hang out with me. Um, when I was in college, if I go to parties and I didn't know anyone, I'd start a dance circle. People would dance. And then, you know. And I would like, I would make the space. I'd get someone to dance in the middle. I'd like hop them up. I'd get someone else to dance. And then I'd break dance. Mm instantly the highest value person in the room. All right, what are the things that you can do? Can you tell jokes really well? Can you do improv really well? Um, can you, do you have a great sense of style? Right, people who love style, that's why they like it is because it gives them social value. Mm. Um, do you know how to do someone's nails really well or do their hair really well or do their makeup really well? Because I promise you, no matter who you are, if you're in high school and you can like braid other girls' hair in like an amazing way or do their you know, makeup, everybody will want to be your friend. Mm. So like just find some skills. <laughs> right? Like people are, oh, he's got like such a hot car. Yeah. Like the car is part of the person. Um, but you know what I did? I didn't have a hot car when I was in high school at all. I had like a thousand dollar, um, uh, Ford Windstar from like 19, like seven, like very old car. Like, yeah, my sister used to call it like the creepy minivan. 
But you know what I did with the creepy minivan? It had seven seats. So I would always drive other people to lunch. Mm. Oh my God, people loved me because there was utility in the fact that I was like willing to drive them to lunch. Mm. Even though it was a crappy car. Who cares? Um, so just like figure out what is awesome about you. And then that's the key when you approach either people in real life or when you approach people online. You can't just be a moocher like we talked about before. You have to be someone who can bring value as well. So let's say you're DMing a random person on the internet. If you just go, hey, I watched you in this podcast. I thought you were really amazing. Can we be friends? I'll say yes, but there's no reason for me to invest in the friendship. But let's say you message me and you say, hey, I watched you in this podcast. I've watched every other thing that you've done. I've read all your articles. Here are uh, the three principles that I actually think are your real principles. Um, and uh, also, I edited this video for you. And the video is actually really good. I'd be like, oh, awesome. I want to be friends with this person because if I'm friends with them, they'll like give me really good videos. Um, and like, here's three book recommendations that I think are really good. Now, if you give me book recommendations that, that, like, that suck, not valuable. Mm-hmm. But let's say you like, presented me with some books that I actually I really want to read that stuff. That, that's great. Oh, hey, Cliff, blah, blah. Uh, and and oh, you write a blog post about how amazing Speechify is and you make an ad for Speechify and you get three people to buy Speechify. Dude, I'm going to love you immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, so... What you want to do is when you present yourself to be evaluated by others, make sure that there's a couple of things about you that actually are awesome mm. so that there's just no way that you'll be judged to be less than. Mm. And if you really build these pillars of excellence in your life, even if some random idiot judges you to be less than, it'll roll off, off you because you know that you're awesome mm. because you have these attributes. So that's it. Like, look, the easiest one is fitness. Um, my uh, ability to make friends skyrocketed when I started to be able to bench press like 230 pounds. Mm. Not because of the weight, but because my chest got so big that it doesn't matter what t-shirt I wear, like I command a room. Mm. I remember I went with a friend to uh, Paris once for a pitch competition. I didn't speak French. And I walked around the room and I felt very uncomfortable because I couldn't communicate with people. But in the back of my head, I was like, well, uh, at least I like fit my shirt well. Like, <laughs> like yeah. it's unlikely that someone's going to come to me and bully me and be like, who the fuck are you? Get out of here. Like, no, it's just like you wouldn't do that because like I'm big. Mm. Um, and so if you're a guy, it's really easy to build muscle. If you're a girl, it's really easy to build muscle. And I say easy, not because it's uh, not uh, time consuming and uh requires work it's easy because if you eat right and you exercise right mm. there is a hundred percent chance that you will get the outcome that you want um you, obviously you got to experiment around your body etc so like that's the first and easiest thing to do right and we all know this right if you're a guy and you want girls to like you and you want to go up to a girl if you're like fit and you have a good haircut they're just like a lot more likely to want to engage with you mm. same thing if you go to like the popular kids school at, at lunch um now Oh, let's say you're an amazing artist, amazing artist, and you get really into like painting shoes, right? You commented on the fact that I was wearing Air Forces in the white shirt when I walked in. Mm. But let's say my shoes had like an amazing, like, you know, roaring dragon lion design that I, and like, it was actually really dope. You'd be like, whoa, those are really cool kicks. Uh, I'd be like, oh, thanks, man. I, uh, I made them. And you're like, you made them? I'm like, yeah, you know, I drew it. Like, you drew that? Mm. So it doesn't matter what you're I'm really good at freestyle rapping. Right. And I like I wrote an album about the life of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like I love to write music. Some people like that's something that really excites them. Like if I meet someone who's like a really good musician, that really excites me. Mm. And so the thing is, like, you know, I'm really into fantasy audiobooks. If you read more fantasy audiobooks than me, I'm so interested in being your friend because you can recommend a really good fantasy audiobooks book to me. And I can talk to you about the books that I've read. Like that's amazing. Most people like they don't find value in that. And so just like find a couple of areas where the types of people that you want to be friends with, like will really get value from. And that's it. That's the solution. It's very, very simple. Mm. No, I love that. I love that. And you know what's interesting, actually, is um, the pillars of excellence. You see that everywhere, mm. right? Like anyone that you, um, and we see it obviously in our like everyday lives, like people that we just want to be friends with or spend time with, there's something that they're excellent at. There's a reason why. Um, and maybe, I don't know, maybe people would say that's like shallow, but that's how we operate as humans. No, no, I, I don't think there's exchange. shallowness in it at all, right? We're not talking about like they have X amount of money. No, mm. like they are living a thriving, excellent life. And mm. that makes me want to be friends with them. That makes perfect sense. I don't want to be friends with a random bum who's on the couch who doesn't do anything. Mm. Like, why would I want to be friends with that person, right? Probably morally, they're not motivated either. 
Um, and like, I don't want that energy in my life. No shallowness at all. Mm. And you know, you know what I love as well? It's like, sometimes you need to think of like the second and third order effects. What are the byproducts of being excellent at something? Like you're, if, even if we take the, the social interaction, right? If I, um, like, let's take this podcast. If I'm like, I am amazing at podcasting. Yeah. Like I'm going to be the number one, which is what I think I will be. There you go. Um, and, I, and I'm like committed to that craft and I really prepare and I, I do everything to really commit to this craft. When I go up to speak with someone, it's like that confidence exudes. Of course. Because of, because of the time, because of the preparation. And it, you know what? Um, McGregor said it even in the documentary. He said, it's you versus you. Yes. That's the 100. He said the fight game, people say it's 90% mental. He said, I say it's 100% mental. You versus you. When do you show up? How do you prepare? Do you believe that you can beat that man? Um, and that's it. I think that's empowering for people to be like, this is in my control. Just because I was born, I don't know, five, six, and I'm not like dashingly handsome. Like everything is in your control. You can develop the excellence and then people are going to be drawn to you as a byproduct of that. I love that. Um, before, we, before we finish. I'll just add to that, right? Like go, go if you look it. at like Kobe, mm. that's exactly the philosophy that Kobe had, right? Even at the, the number one player in the NBA, he's still waking up in the middle of the night and going to shoot, mm. right? Just like it's 100% you versus you. Mm. 100. Okay. Um, I have to ask you about Mr. Beast, man. I have to. Sure. Um, we've spoken, obviously, about like relationships, uh, building relationships, and just, um, just giving without any sense of like, I'm going to get this back. Sure. With all of that as the context and um, how did that come about? How did you, how did that interaction, I know you spent a week with Mr. Beast, right? Like you spent like pretty significant time. I'm yeah. sure there's a bunch of people on YouTube who are like, I would love to spend a week with Mr. Beast. Sure. What was it like? Um, I mean, it's, it's, we met at a party in LA. Mm. Um, I happened to be there for the day. He happened to be there for the day. It was like very random. Um, and we started talking and I have seven people on our leadership team. He has seven people on his leadership team. There's about 110 people on Speechify, roughly the same people working for Beast Industries at the time. And uh, I just like shared some of the leadership principles I had. And he's like, ooh, this is really good. He's like very curious, he's very smart. Um, and he was sharing some of his principles and I was like, ooh, this is really good. And like we got into like this very intense conversation. <laughs> and he was like, I want you to meet my team. And I was like, okay, I'm down. He's like, you should cancel your flight to New York and just come with me to North Carolina. I was like, all right, sounds good. Um, and uh, so that was great. So I got to spend a lot of time with like, James and Chucky and Tyler and Mario and you know, uh, most recently Matteo and you know, other people who are like part of that crew. And I learned more about YouTube than I ever did before. So you know, I got a lot of value. And um, you know, he was just about to start uh, this like huge fitness around journey, uh, uh, sorry, journey around fitness. Um, and so, yeah, just like a really, really smart dude. Uh, also loves board games. Like we just had a lot of things in common in the same way that, you know, you meet someone at school and like, they also like, I don't know, fantasy audiobooks, whatever it might be. You, uh, um, make friends over that type of stuff. There's a bunch of things that I respect and admire about him. There's a bunch of things that he respects and admires about me. Um, and then, uh, it's great to spend time together because he learns things that I have learned hmm. and I learn things that he, that he has learned. And I mean, you know, Mr. Beast is like particularly well known, but I'll do the same thing. And like, I love staying in other people's houses. I do it all the time. Right. Um, you know, right now I'm staying with my friend, Nick Diao here, uh, who built like a really amazing education company. Um, you know, I'll fly across the country to stay with Brandon Sanderson, who's like a fantasy author. I really love. Hmm. Right. I'm about to go to India, uh, to spend time with, um, like a friend who's having a wedding. But the last time I went to India, I spent time at the house of like the 70 year old parents of a friend of mine. Like, it's not the fact that the person is well known. It's the fact that the person has a life that is different than mine. And something that I can learn about that is just like, I wouldn't learn this from a book. And so I think that's the key is just like seek experiences in your life that will enrich your mental model of the universe and make you understand how other people live. Uh, that's amazing. Like that to me is better than a vacation. You know, we, we spoke about like purpose, right? In the sure. beginning. One of the things I actually wrote it in my notes, um, 
because I think about being successful, about, about achieving the goals, everything that I set out. And one of the things I wrote is like the other side of that, which is once I'm successful, I don't want to lose who I am right now. Of course. I've seen so many examples yeah. with like celebrities or business people that they achieve all of these things and they, it's almost like they lose the essence. It becomes too much. hundred percent. And so, and I think I've heard this said as well, which is like, sometimes your greatest strength can become your greatest weakness mm. or it can be like a curse almost. And I think through this conversation and, I, and, and it'll be interesting to see, see what the audience think as well. Um, but your capacity to just brute strength things, to just will something into existence. I'm going to keep going until it happens. I'm not going to quit. It's never over. That's an incredible strength to have, mm. right? And so what I think about, and I even remember actually earlier in the conversation, you said there's a, there's a gap. There's a gap between where I am now and there's a gap to where I know I can be. Yes. And it's interesting because I have, I have a very similar thing. Like I, I want to maximize. I, yeah, I, wanna, oh, I just, I want to leave it. I want to leave it all out there. Like I want to look back on my life and be like, I left it all on the field. I took, I remember Kobe said this. He was like, the reason I wasn't um, afraid of retirement, I knew I put everything into the game of basketball. Mm. Every drop of talent that I had, I maximized it. I optimized it. And I love that. I'm curious, have you ever thought about the other side of the brute forcing and the sense of like, will there be a moment for you in your life where you can authentically, you can genuinely sit down in your seat and be like, I don't need to brute force anything. Like, it's just, it's enough. Like what I did is enough it's your kobe retirement moment it's the mic drop moment it's the yes I'm done. in avenues of life not in life as a whole right so mm. kobe retired from basketball and then he went full force on storytelling i think he won a grammy or a tony for storytelling mm. um so one person i really admire in this regard is theodore roosevelt roosevelt was born astigmatic um nobody wanted to be his friend he used to get bullied started working out got a big chest became very athletic um went to harvard even in Harvard, you know, got the, you know, uh, did boxing and got like destroyed. Um, became a senator in New York. Eventually put together the Rough Riders, went to uh, join the Spanish-American War, became president. And after he became president, he still did so many things. He was a naturalist. He read so many books. He published a lot of things. He went to explore the river of doubt in Brazil post being president as an explorer. Like this guy never stops. And so it doesn't matter what area of life you go hard in, just go hard. And so for me, yes, like I have a smaller focus on weightlifting now than I did before because my body is where I want it to be. But now I'm going really, really hard on gymnastics and parkour. Um, I'm going a lot harder on music than I used to. Um, and uh, the nice thing about the core text to speech app for Speechify is, you know, Speechify lets you read anything. It doesn't matter if it's a, PDF, Word document, physical document, your text messages, you know, email, you just click a button, it reads, it's amazing. Um, the way I give the analogy is, you know, if you lived in LA and you need to use your car to drive places, like it's a hassle to get in the car, drive somewhere, you go to the gym. Imagine you just ran really fast. Just get out of the house and you immediately run to wherever you like, essentially you have the ability to teleport. I have the ability to essentially teleport information into my brain. Like, mm. if you're curious, like, why I have such a deep understanding of the world and I understand my purpose and all these things, I just listen really fast. I listen at 800 words per minute. Most people listen at 200 words per minute. So I listen to everything four times faster than everyone because they use the Speechify Chrome extension and iOS app. Um, so that app is already so good. That's not the main focus. The main focus is building the audiobooks product and building the AI team and, you know, a bunch of tools that are coming out of those things. Um, and at a certain point, when I have kids, my biggest focus will be focusing on my kids and being the best dad that I can be. So I'm just setting myself up for the most important game, which is raising a family. And most people are like lackadaisical about it. I'm not. I think it's the most important thing that you do. I want to be a dad like my dad. I want to be able to have the capacity to give a huge amount of love to my children. Because you know what? Love, like any other muscle, requires work to make it like big and strong and able. 
And so I think that my capacity to give love has increased tremendously over the last 20 years. And when I have kids, they're just all going to receive that love constantly in every area of their life. I'm going to strive to be the best possible father that I could possibly be. Um, and to, in giving love, it's not just the intention that matters. It's actually like, can you make someone's life better? Like, can you help them and guide them through good decisions? Can you support them in doing things that are hard? Can you help them find their purpose? Like at the end of the day, you are a teacher and you are a facilitator and I want to be an exceptional teacher, an exceptional facilitator because I want to have kids who are greater than me. Um, so that'll be a focus. And that's something that I will go at with very big intensity when my kids are young and as they grow and as they mature into their own people, obviously, you know, I have to lay back and then I'll find another project. And so if I look at people I really admire, let's take Bill Gates as an example. He went really hard at Microsoft, but at a certain point, he was like, cool, it's enough. I'm going to start the most effective philanthropic foundation in the world. And Bill Gates is still going really hard. You know, Jeff Bezos left Amazon, but he's still going really hard with his philanthropical efforts and um, his space company. Elon Musk, same thing. I would say Elon Musk is overdoing it. Um, so uh, the answer is no. I think that uh, there's something very sad about someone who only sees the value in themselves through their job or their career and their career is over, their life is over, like you're guaranteeing yourself they're gonna die younger. You gotta find meaning in different things. Maybe it's stamp collecting, maybe it's traveling, maybe it's like being really invested in being an extremely involved grandfather. I don't care what it is, but you have to have things that you care about uh, and that is what keeps you alive and what makes life exciting and fun and thriving and worthwhile. Um, it goes back to the fantasy books. You are the main character of your book. Nobody wants to read a book about a guy who's on the couch watching TV, eating potato chips. I want to read books about a guy who's jumping out of planes and summoning mountains and recruiting people to go to the Spanish-American War and bodybuilding and writing music even though he's 85 years old. That's the guy I want to be. And so I think that for, for everybody, that's how it works. And so uh, I have one major bonfire in my life, with this, which is Speechify. And a couple of other smaller fires like fitness and music and writing and whatever it might be. And with time, I'll shift my priorities around, but I'm always going to keep going hard. Mm, that's beautiful, man. Now, this episode is going to get people off the couch. This episode is going to make some shit happen. I hope so. Love it, brother. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, on. thanks for having me. It was super fun. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the channel. We're having fire conversations every week on the podcast. Before we end the episode, a quick word from our sponsor, Free Agency. What if I told you there is a good chance you're leaving money on the table in your career? It would kind of annoy you a bit, right? Well, Free Agency aims to stop that. They represent and manage talent in the tech industry. Here's how they do it. First, they provide you with a dedicated talent agent. Think about this as your career quarterback. They understand you and your career goals. Based on that understanding, they bring you suitable interviews at top firms. You focus on smashing the interview and together with their network, research, negotiation expertise, they will make sure you get a top of market salary. Stop job searching alone and start building your dream career today with free agency.